One thing, keep in mind when we talk about the profiles, we're not talking about a profile of your group time, and we're not talking about a profile of your group result. We're talking about the profile of who shows up at your door. Okay? These are the people that show up for groups. Now, we got another old spreadsheet on the group experience. Say, thank God they're not going to tell us that. <clears throat> it's a profile of who shows up. When they ring the bell, you look out, and they're wearing a cap. Use your own labels, low commitment, medium commitment, high commitment. But that, those are the people showing up. A second entirely different question is what do we do to minister to those people? Honestly, that's our job, to help you, equip you, give you models for, give you ways to minister to the people to whom you're called. And a third category is what should they look like when they come back out the door? See, so don't confuse them. Because these aren't profiles of group experiences, even though the profile will help determine the group experience. You don't minister to all three of those groups the same. It will make you crazy. Some of you are trying to do it, and you can say, yeah, it will make you crazy. Nobody's immune from it, because people show up. So that, that's the profiles of who show up. Second thing, to put it all in context, is this is what I expect to be the normal movement right now. Low commitment to medium commitment to high commitment. But let me say two observations about it. It doesn't have to be. Okay? You can go from low commitment into high commitment. We're not talking about a linear process where everybody's got to go through every single step. The second thing, that is primarily a result. Well, it's just where we're at. Okay, I'll just say that. Uh, if people have not adequately heard the true gospel, if they have come in and they think praying the prayer and getting to heaven is the true gospel, this is where they will naturally go. They'll say, well, am I going to heaven? I'm not going to deal with it. That's God's business. But that's where the anemic gospel takes people. I'll pray the prayer, and then I'll try to hold on until I get to heaven. And the main thing I want the pastor to tell me is how much fun I can have and still get into heaven. How close I get to the line to get into the heaven. Well, that's going to produce low commitment people. It is not the gospel you're hearing from the pulpit. The message, that's why we started with it. We just look like we don't know what we're doing. We do. That's why I started with the message. The message, the good news, is that you are invited to be a part of what Jesus Christ is doing today and forever. Let me tell you, Sunday morning, last Sunday, at the end of the message, when Pastor Daniel said, how many people here want more than you've been having? The people that raised their hand were not signing on for a low commitment group. They were raising their hand saying, I want more. Show me how to get it. And if you think you can go down there and somebody lay hands on you and pray for you and you'll walk away and you've got it, that's going to last until halfway through lunch. We know that. Sometimes some things will happen down there and you'll experience inner healing and deliverance and some things will happen like that. But really what you're saying is I've decided to follow Jesus. That's the gospel they're hearing. And they're hearing it over and over and over. That you are invited into life with God. And when they raise their hand, they're saying, I want it. Okay, but right now, we start with what we got. And I'm not being critical of people, but we got people who say, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus. I prayed a prayer 18 years ago. And uh, I think he hadn't forgotten about it. So, realistically, this is where we're at. But the truth is... Um, it doesn't have to be linear like that. Okay, so just keep that in mind so you don't get too married to that. You remember almost a year ago when we talked about the different phases of discipleship. We said when Jesus ministered to the come and see people, the follow me people, the be with me people, the remaining people, the remaining people, I asked you the question. I said, when was Jesus doing the will of God? In which phase of discipleship? And somebody wisely said, in every one of them. Well, which one was important? Somebody wisely said, every one of them. 
So it's not a matter of diminishing or categorizing the value of leadership. It's a matter of saying, this is where I'm called to plug in. Jesus did it all. I'm not Jesus. Where am I called? And so what we're going to be asking you to do is just talk and spend some time thinking about this. Because you really, I, I saw y'all taking good notes, and I appreciate it. A lot of these categories and, and things we're working through, we're really working through to help us figure out how to structure groups to address those people. Okay? But you really don't have to study the categories. When I say low commitment, there's a few names that probably come to your mind. I say medium commitment. You got, yeah, I got. Or I say high commitment. I mean, you know what we're talking about in general in those categories. And so the question you will have to, or we invite you to spend some time doing, I, I would appreciate being released to do this if I was a uh, small group leader in church. We invite you to prayerfully consider, spend some time prayerfully considering to which of these groups, to which of these stages, to which of these phases are you primarily called to invest in by helping them move? To which of these stages are you primarily called to invest in by helping them move? Let me tell you, there's not an extra word or a superfluous word in that sentence I worked on. And so every word in there makes is important. Because honestly, Pastor Daniel alluded to it. You may spend time in prayer and say, I'm not called to help people move. That's okay, but you moved yourself outside the small group ministry of community church. If you're not interested in helping people move, that is perfectly okay. When I go to a movie with some friends, my goal that day is not to help people move. But I'm not going to call it small group ministry of community church. So the question is, to which group are you primarily called by God to invest in to help them move? Because, see, we did it in order. We said this is the ministry of the church. This is small group ministry. You're small group leaders. Leaders are called to help people move. To whom are you called to help people move? Pastor Daniel will wrap up with the final comments. But if you say, well, I just don't want to help people move. But I think the answer for a lot of people will be for the first time, you'll say, you mean I get to pay? I appreciate it. You'll, you'll let me have some voice in who you send to my house? Thank you. You will give me a place to suggest some of the people in my living room should go instead of where they're at? I mean, if you got somebody right now, they're miserable with what you're doing. And you love them. Wouldn't you like to have a list of two or three groups? Say, hey, I, I hear you. And really, you'd be more comfortable in one of these. Why? Because we've gone through this process. And we've reduced the frustration for you as a leader by sending you the wrong people. We've reduced the frustration of the people by sending them to the wrong places. And we've empowered you to give them a place to go where they're a better fit. Right now, if they're not a good fit, I doubt if very many people in this room would know where to send them. That's what we want to help rectify in 2013. You got somebody that's showing up in your group wanting to do uh, inductive Bible study with Greek exegesis in the middle of the group and they're making y'all crazy? Where do you send them? You got somebody that's mad because you said, well, what did you get out of the Bible this week? Where do you send them? See? Because invariably, if we do this, we're going to have to be honest and realize our groups may redefine themselves in 2013. David and Maris went through this. They came in. They inherited a group. It was a good group. I'd say one of our better groups. If I could. Uh, how many of y'all got left that you inherited? Two. Two? What happened? That group redefined itself. What am I saying? That's a bad group? No, it's a good group. Been there. Good group. But they redefined it around the calling and passion of David and Mary. what they bring to the group. And some people didn't like it. Well, they went somewhere else. Some other people were looking for it. They came there. Let me tell you, I've been doing small group ministry a long time. It is painful to talk about redefining groups. Some of my friends 
uh, Gene Kim had a commitment and had to leave. I appreciate them being here as long as they could. But uh, I had to leave Gene's group to start discipleship. It took me a couple years to explain to him exactly what happened. And we were friends. We traveled together. We vacationed together. And I said, Gene, next week will be my last week in the group. I'll see you. Uh, that wasn't easy. No, we got over it. <laughs> okay. but, but if you really want to be free to minister to the people to whom you're called, if we were starting from scratch and it wasn't a single group, this is the way it would look. You'd figure out where you're called. We'd say, okay, you're in this category, this category, this category. We'd talk to the people and we'd send the people that fit. But instead, you've inherited a one-room schoolhouse. And so uh, if you want to just keep struggling with it, you're welcome to. But it's a struggle for you and it's a struggle for the people. So to which group are you primarily called to invest by helping them move? And uh, what we're going to do is, is we're not going to send you a questionnaire. I'm going to call you. I'll either talk to you on the phone. I'll set up a meeting with you. But I want to know what God's telling you. It's not what we're telling you. That's what we're talking about. Calling instead of assignment. What's God telling you? What are you called to? To which one of those groups do you go, oh yeah, give me some of those. Now, I don't minimize other people's calling, but I know my calling. Anybody around me knows my calling. I'm not called to low commitment people. I will frustrate them. They'll frustrate me. It's not a good experience. That doesn't make me better in some else. It just tells me who I need to be looking for. Now, when I'm ready to a low commitment person where I live, work, and play, should I be salt and light and cast vision and call them into the kingdom and help them? Yeah. That's why that word primarily was in there. To what group are you primarily called? That's going to be your group. So... What your response will do is help us guide group composition in 2013. It'll help us decide who to send to you. It'll help us decide where you may be able to suggest some other people go. Uh, and it'll help us with training. Pastor Daniel alluded to that. Uh, my biggest apology for this year is, is I think it's been necessary for people to hear stuff they already know. Uh, I'll get in trouble when I say this. Just because I'll overlook somebody, but, but I'm pretty sure Ronnie and Gloria have missed a single leader's meeting in the last 12 months. Is that a fair assumption? Larry and Betty had missed a lead, leader's meeting in the last 12 months. Fair assumption. And now somebody else is here going, yeah, but I didn't, and that's why I still get in trouble. But you know what that means? That means every week I get up, every meeting, and say some stuff I already said. And they got to listen to me say it again because there's some people here that didn't hear it when I said it the last week. And I just feel like puke. And I'm just like, I hate for people to repeat themselves too. It says in the Bible it's good though. So somebody told me that recently. So maybe it's good. I still feel lousy because I'm going over the same stuff. I'm going over stuff that people have sat in my living room for two years in heart. And they come and they're gracious enough to look at me and be interested. Right? And they're teaching it already. See? And we had to do that this year because we were in transition. We won't do it in 2013. If you're invited to some time with us, it will be to precisely hone in on your gifts and your calling and to help you do what you're called to do at this season of life in the ministry God's placed you. And so uh, I'm excited about that and I'm, I have some trepidation because it sounds like more work. But that's okay. Uh, double my pay. Uh, that's okay. Because I think that's what we need to be doing in 2013. I'm happy about 2012. I'm happy about your response. But next year, we're going to get more precise and more strategic. And I don't know how to be strategic without knowing where you're at. So does that make sense? Okay. So you'll be looking for that answer. Let me say, and I won't spend any significant amount of time on it, just so you don't think we're overly simplistic. We understand there are specialty needs that arise that cannot be met through our normal small group ministry. Okay? That's one of the things. I'm not crazy about forming a lot of new group categories when I don't have anybody called for that. 
But see, I may have somebody come in that says, look, all this is great, but I'll tell you, my passion, my heart, is for dealing with recovering addicts. Rob does it. Sally helps him. We may have somebody else. You talk to, to a discipleship group, so you come in. So that's my passion. Uh, well, that's what I'd call a specialty group. We're going to send you there. We're going to get you delivered. We're going to get you set free. And then we're going to get you back in the mainstream. See? It's not a permanent road. There may be people that need inner healing so bad, I can't talk to them about a reading plan. Well, good. I'll send them over here and let them get some inner healing. And then get them where? Back into the mainstream of movement. There may be somebody whose husband died last week. God help you if you want to talk to them about a reading plan. They need some grief recovery time. The deal is you don't need it for the next 15 years. You need somebody that knows how to minister in grief recovery to get them bound up, get them back on their feet, and back into the mainstream. What's the parable of the Good Samaritan? What did he do? Sit down on the side of the road and pat the guy on the arm? Poor guy, he got beat up. And just sit there with him. He bound his wounds. He bandaged him up. He took him to the inn. He said, I'll come back. I'll take care of the deal. He got him back on the road. See? And so when we talk about small group ministry, that's a very real part of it. Sometimes people need a specialty touch for a season that small group leaders may not be equipped to deal with. Now, people may need deliverance. So we need to be able to say, hey, if that's what they need, where do they go? Does that sound like a lot of plans? Yeah. Uh, I didn't inherit these dark circles. I like, oh, I got a dream about that. New believers. There's, yeah. God's call on your life is not bound by any structure we got. That's what I want to hear from you. This is what God's calling me to. This is what excites me. This is what makes me want to live. This is what, when I stand before the Father, I know He's going to ask me, how did you do with the talents? That's what he's going to call me to be accountable for. It's not how good I was Joel Osteen. It's how good did I fulfill his calling on my life. If you spend time in prayer and you don't know his calling on your life, spend some more time. If you decide you're, you're not called to be a leader, then just come on and say that. That's okay. Uh, you may be called to be a leader, but for a season of time, you just need to rest. Don't be embarrassed about that. So, our goal is then to reduce frustration, to focus the training and the equipping, to hear your heart and partner with you to see you fulfill the calling on your life for the sake of community church and for the sake of the world. Because the people you touch and impact will go beyond the walls of your meeting and touch and impact them. So, that's the question that I'm going to be calling you and asking you. As to which group are you primarily called to invest in by helping them move? Some of you already have a real good idea. For some of you, maybe it's a little scary to be asked that. For some of you, it's exciting to be asked that because nobody's asked you lately. But it's where I believe we are. I'm going to let Pastor Daniel close this with the cleaning up the message I've made and, and some closing thoughts. I'll share this with you. Um, this is just what I see. And I may be wrong. But this is what I sense I hear from God. So when I look back, there was a time when the move of the Holy Spirit came in the late 60s and early 70s and people were filled with the Spirit and they got on fire for God. And God allowed people to bloom where they were planted. I was in the church of God. They didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And God let me just stay there and uh, bloom there and grow and touch people and finally convince a pastor to let me preach on speaking in tongues in a church that didn't believe in and that was the time that people like the ladies and were filled with the Holy Spirit in a denominational church. And God let them bloom where they were planted. And then this time in the early 80s, I think what happened is that season came to a close. That was a season of full gospel business. That was a season of women's of love. Some of you said, what's he talking about? 
There was a season of God working outside the denominational walls, outside of where you call church home, to grow and raise up the people. But I think in the early 80s, I think he said it's time to gather the flowers together. You bloomed where you were planted, but it's time to draw together into a body of people. And that happened in communities all over the United States and maybe all over the world. And that was the time when we saw people leaving Park Avenue Methodist and coming to community. To go from work blooming where they were planted to coming together as a body. And, and the strength of that kind of community was, was built and reinforced out of that. And with some risk, I'm not, I'm not big to move in the prophetic, but this is just what I see, and I'm making it wrong. But I believe what happened after that in the last decade is the Holy Spirit, Spirit began to blow again across denominational lines. And things that I'm familiar with, things like Emmaus, the Holy Spirit blew right across denominational lines and challenged people and stirred them up and called them into a life with God. It happened in organizations that I'm a part of nationally and internationally where the Holy Spirit blew across denominational lines. And people again began to bloom where they were planted. And we began to see it again. People stirred by God, just like the old lay witness mission all over again. People were stirred. And right there in their home churches, Episcopal, Methodist, and Presbyterian, they were growing. And this is where, maybe I'm wrong, but I think we're entering a season of God saying it's time to regather those that are passionate for the kingdom and bring them together. I think it's coming to a season to where they've done what they can do in some of the denominational restrictions they operate under. And I really believe that the Spirit of God is calling people into places like this where they can be equipped and sent beyond what they can do with some of the denominational restrictions. And I want to be a people that's ready to receive and equip them and change the world. And I believe God's going to do it. The only question is whether we'll be a part of it. Somebody made a comment that I was trying to change what Melvin did. Well, I don't think so. But if I am, I think she would forgive me. I hope 20 years from now, anybody, if community is still here in ministry, I hope nobody says, you're trying to change what they must Because of the Spirit of God's movement. I mean, I've read all of Noah's stuff. I've read David's stuff as they formed this. And, and honestly, 99.9% .9 of the stuff we're saying uh, I can just hear her saying amen, amen, amen. It's a little different focus in one sense, and that is we're doing some teaching by the way of guiding self-discovery. That's what discipleship is. The difference in this curriculum group is, is we don't lecture to people and then try to help them understand what we said. We, if you were in the Hearing God class and uh, when I lectured, and I had that long list of scriptures where God spoke, it was so tiny you couldn't read it, and some people laughed at it. Well, you know what I could do in the sanctuary is flash it up. And so there it is. These are all places God talked. In my small group setting, you would have, by the time you showed up, you would have looked up and read every one of those verses, all that long list of all the times God spoke. And you would have considered, in each case, how did he speak directly or through somebody else or and all the ways God spoke. And you would have spent several hours learning that, and then we would have talked about it. And that would have been a process of guided self-discovery. And so, honestly, that's, that's kind of where my passion is. But I understand it's not where everybody necessarily is. But I do believe that it, it's essential that we be a people that's ready to move. And so, to the extent we may do, be doing some home teaching, that is different. Because it was very strategic that we decided not to have teaching in small groups. And the reason why, because I was there. Uh, we had people coming in from out of town and, and teachers that would come through once a week. And the whole group 
was determined by the popularity of whoever came in at whatever house they were in. And very wisely, the church leadership said, we don't want to form groups around the popularity of teachers. And so we'll do the teaching here, and then we'll have our group time. I tell you, we live in a time where these people that God's sending in, they can't even make it through a 20-minute sermon without texting, tweeting, twerping, or whatever. Their attention spans eight minutes. And so we're going to reach this generation and the next generation in different ways. So to the extent that's a little shift that we're doing some teaching in the homes, that's true. There was a time where people would listen to Pastor Daniel's sermon and go home and sat around the dining table and spent the next hours talking about the sermon. And how did they apply that? What did he mean by that? We don't live in that time anymore. So we say, now, Wednesday night, he teaches on hearing God. We're not going to sit around the dinner table. Let's sit around the living room. What did he say? Can we understand it? Can we really internalize it? Can we put it into practice? How do we do that? So 2013 is not going to be the same thing as 1970s and early 80s. But I believe the wind of the Spirit is blowing. And I believe he's drawing. He's drawing people into a place to where they can be trained and equipped and discipled to be a body that's without spot and blemish that will change the world and meet the bride. And I want to be a part of it. I want you to be a part of it. In life, if you're calling, and where you see yourself.